Hello, welcome to the Donish Show. I'm Noah Donish, and today we have a very special guest, Mr. Schoenberg. Thank you so much for joining me, Mr. Schoenberg. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So can you first tell us a little bit about your childhood? My childhood, I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, not in Beverly Hills, in Brentwood, actually. And I went to Kedra Canyon Elementary and then to Harvard School for high school. Uh, and then I went to Princeton for college. So I went away and then I came back and finished up at law school at USC. Why do you think you decided to go into the lawyer field? Well, I was, actually I was a math science guy uh, all the way through and I, I majored in math even at Princeton in college. But it was pretty clear by about the junior year that I wasn't gonna be great in math. And uh, my dad was a judge. He had been a public defender. Uh, matter of fact, he was a commissioner in Beverly Hills before he became a uh, Los Angeles judge. And he, uh, he always said that lawyers are people who are sort of good in a lot of things, but not really good at anything. <laughs> and that was me. I was, I was good at a lot of different things. I did not just math and, and science, but I also was uh, a news editor of the newspaper. Wow. And I was a DJ on the classical radio. And uh, you know, I liked a lot of different things. So, so I thought, OK, let's try lawyering. And, uh, and I went to law school. and. Got through that, passed the bar, and then got a job, and that's that's how I became a lawyer. And then, how do you think your parents and your grandparents influenced your childhood and decisions to become a lawyer? Well, I had uh, growing up, I really only had one grandparent, my mom's mom. Uh, my grandfather's had died in the 50s before I was born, uh, and my my dad's mother died right after I was born. So I only had one grandparent, but she was terrific. And uh, all four of my grandparents were refugees from the Nazis. Uh, my dad's parents had fled from Germany in 1933. They were Austrian, but they had been living in, in Berlin. So they fled in 1933 and made their way to the United States and came to Los Angeles in 1934, where my dad was born. Uh, but my mom's parents left the day after Kristallnacht, which is November 9, 1938, uh, from Vienna. Uh, they had scheduled to leave on November 10. Uh, they were trying to flee all that that time after the Nazis took over Austria. And they managed to escape the same trajectory into France first and then to, uh, to the East Coast and then to Los Angeles. So my parents all grew up here. And I, I grew up in that uh, environment of refugees from, from Hitler. Uh, most of my you know, grandparents' friends or my parents' friends uh, had some connection to that. And, and so uh, I was always very aware of, of that background that I had. I, th I think that influenced me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And that environment that you, were, that you were growing up with, what do you think, how do you think it shaped you it, to make you who you are today? I think I, I was always aware of how lucky I was to be alive. Uh, it was only because my grandparents had been uh, lucky enough and smart enough to, to escape that I even existed at all. And so I, I felt sort of a a duty to remember what they went through, and uh, a duty to you know make the most of the time I had to do to do the right thing and uh, and make the most of it. From being a lawyer, what do you think are some of the challenges you have? And so being a lawyer, uh, it it changes uh, through your career. When you're starting out, uh, you start out. Most people start out in a firm environment, or even if you're working in the public sector, you're on the low end of the totem pole and you do what they tell you to do. Uh, you don't necessarily get to choose your own clients. You don't get to choose the work that you're doing. And you just try to do the best you can for the clients that you're representing and for the, the other lawyers who are giving you work. Uh, and so there's that, that balance there. Uh, as you get older and more independent, you start to get your own clients. You start to be able to sort of choose your own way uh, through the law. and. Um, I was very fortunate. I worked at, at two large firms, and then I went out on my own and was able to, to open up my own office. I, I then, uh, a few years later, had a partner. But I was able to basically take the cases I wanted to take and do them the way I, I wanted to do uh, the work. And, uh, and that suited my personality very well. I, I wasn't so happy, I think, uh, sort of doing things other people's way. I always wanted to, to try to do things a little differently. That's maybe a, a character flaw, uh, but, but I, try, I, I was always thinking of different ways of doing things. And, uh, and so working on my own allowed me to do that. And, and I really uh, was very lucky that that worked for me. 
And you took on a notable case that was uh, portrayed in the movie Woman in Gold. Can you speak right. about that case? Yeah, so it ties together these two conversations. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother had a very close friend, Maria Altman, who was like her, a refugee from the Nazis. And she called me uh, while I was still working at one of the big firms downtown and asked me to help her try to recover paintings that were stolen from her family. So I convinced my firm to allow me to help her a little bit, um, but uh, uh, without filing a lawsuit, they wanted me just to help her with uh, negotiate with the government in Austria, but the Austrians decided not to give back the paintings, and so the only chance we had was to file a lawsuit, and the firm didn't want to do that. So I decided to leave the firm and go out on my own, and uh, that was in the year 2000. Uh, I guess you were born that year, probably, uh, because uh, uh, Nathan, my son, who knows you, was a uh, was born right after I left my job, mm -hmm. and uh, took some time off while he was after he was born, and then I opened up my own office. And one of the first things I did was I filed a lawsuit against Austria, against the country of Austria, uh, which was pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. and I think everybody thought it was a little stupid and crazy, but uh, it was a way of of keeping the case alive and really trying to push it forward. And we didn't know what would happen. Uh, and I was all on my own and uh, it was very complicated and, and I had no idea really what what was going to come next. Uh, and what come, came next was the case ended up going all the way to the US Supreme Court, which no one could have anticipated, I think. Uh, and that took four years to go up to the Supreme Court on the issue of whether we were even allowed to sue Austria. And uh, Again, by some sort of miracle, uh, I won that, that uh, case in the Supreme Court. Uh, no one thought it was going to happen. I was not really overconfident <laughs> either, but, uh, but we did win. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I got to start really the lawsuit here in, in Los Angeles. But after about a year and a half, uh, where the lawyers sort of you know, fight with each other doing what's called discovery, uh, Austria offered to do an arbitration in Austria to resolve the case and get it over with. And Maria Altman, my client, uh, who lived here in, in Cheviot Hills, uh, she was almost 90 years old. So I said, you know, Maria, we could keep going in the United States. Everybody loves us. Uh, the judges are all very favorable, but it's going to take forever. Uh, they could go back up to the Supreme Court on some issue. It would be another five years. And I said, you know, if we go to Austria, we really have a chance. I think we could win it, and then we would really win. And so she trusted me, thank goodness, and we went back to Austria. I went back to Austria and argued an, an arbitration with three judges. And we waited and waited and waited for a decision. And finally, in January 2006, so 10 years ago, uh, we won the case. And they ruled in our favor. And they actually returned five incredibly valuable paintings to Maria Altman. And when I say valuable, the, one of the paintings was sold to Ronald Lauder for his museum, the Neue Gallery in New York, and became the most expensive painting in the world at that time. Uh, and the other four paintings were ultimately sold off by Maria and the rest of her family uh, at an auction. It was the highest grossing auction and the most for any single artist. I mean, it held all these records. Uh, but at the time we started out, we didn't really know that that is where it was going to end up. But it was um, really one of the most spectacular successes uh, that, that anybody's ever had. And so a few years later, we were contacted by a filmmaker, Simon Curtis, who had uh, contacted the BBC Films, and they, they wanted to do a movie about it. So, so uh, we said yes, and that took yet another <laughs> five or six years. And I guess it was last year, uh, mm -hmm. 2015, in, in April, this film, Woman in Gold, came out. And uh, I was played by Ryan Reynolds. Wow. Which is sort of a joke because no one, I think, looks at me and says, oh, sexiest man alive, People Magazine, right? Uh, so, but apparently they, they thought Ryan Reynolds could be me, and uh, Maria was played by Helen Mirren, who's one of the great actresses of the world, and it was a huge success. It was, I think, the highest grossing independent film of the year, and uh, very, very happy that so many people have seen it. And going back to the beginning of the case, you said you left your law firm to take on this case. What gave you the courage to continue? There were a number of different factors. I had, I had been at one firm for about six years and then went to another firm, uh, planning to stay about three years and see what was going to happen. Uh, that firm was not really expanding. It ended up actually closing down that office mm -hmm. uh, a few years later. And so uh, the writing was on the wall a little bit that way. But also, I really wanted to be my own boss. I wanted 
to be able to file a lawsuit for Maria Altman. I want to do a whole bunch of different things, uh, work closer to home and be uh, near my family, having a, a new baby, it was our second child. Uh, we had a third, ultimately. And uh, so a combination of factors, I decided just to open up my own office. And I had a friend who had a real estate company, and they had an extra office you know, on his floor. Mm -hmm. So I just rented a small space, and, and you know they gave me a desk, and I bought a computer, and and tried to be a lawyer myself. Uh, was, you know, no secretary, no <laughs> nothing. When I had to do all the filing and all the stapling and, and everything myself, uh, but it was good, a very good experience for me yeah. to learn really all the aspects of having a firm. And like I said, ultimately a year or so later, I uh, in the elevator I found a, a lawyer uh, who who gave me some work and then asked me to be his partner, and uh, and so then we had a small firm and. I was very happy with that. So it was, uh, when you asked sort of why did I do it, it was a combination of, of mm -hmm. things. And you know, I think a lot of people try to do things on their own and, and it doesn't work out. Uh, and I was prepared for that too. I, I told my wife, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll put my tail between my legs and <laughs> go back to a firm and beg for a job. Uh, but fortunately, yeah. it, it worked out very Ultimately well for me. It worked yeah. out. And then you also talked about a, lo a lot about being away from your family a lot. How was that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't as much away from my family. I did do a lot of traveling when I was mm -hmm. representing Maria over those eight years. Uh, and I would go to Austria, and my wife Pam was very nice and let me do that and took care of the kids while I was gone. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I think lawyers tend to travel a lot. Uh, it depends on what type of law you do, but you're, you're a hired gun. So when someone needs you to go somewhere and do something for them, you, you go. Uh, so I was used to that, and and uh, you know I think it was it was necessary for the case. But I I was always taught by my mentors, and and certainly my my dad was like that too. To you know you should be home for dinner with with the family, and uh, and so I always tried to be to be home at six o'clock or six thirty for for dinner with everybody. Uh, and when I when I found an office, it was very close to where we lived, so I could be home in in uh, Five, 10, 15 minutes, and um, and that was very important to me. So I, I think if you ask my kids, I, I was <laughs> I was around Perfect. most of the time, but uh, but there were mm -hmm. stretches where I had to go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to the film, how closely did you work with them throughout the process of making a film? Yeah, there were a couple of documentaries that were made of the case, especially at the end uh, uh, with the Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, what happened was the BBC Films hired a, a screenwriter. And he came out and interviewed me, and we continued to to sort of correspond over email. And he ultimately put together a a draft of a script, and uh, and sent it to me. And I wrote lots of comments and sent it to him. And then they ignored the comments and wrote another <laughs> draft. And <laughs> same thing happened a few times. But he, it was very friendly. And and the writer Alexi K. Campbell is a, is a terrific guy, and he. Uh, you know, sometimes he would ask me, "Did anything like this happen?" I'd say, "Oh yeah, there were these three <laughs> things," and he'd turn that into a into a scene in the film. So mm -hmm. it was very collaborative in that respect. And I, I offered to be on set uh, if they wanted, but they didn't want me necessarily, <laughs> which I totally understand. I think it would be very distracting as an actor mm -hmm. if you're trying to act as someone to see that you know to have that person there criticizing you because acting is not the same as mimicking, mm -hmm. right? So he's not trying to to be me, he's trying to play a, a character, and I think having the actual person there would be very distracting. So I, I understood uh, very much that when Ryan Reynolds uh, said he didn't want to do that, I ultimately did meet him on the last day of shooting, and he was really he was very nice. <laughs> and uh, matter of fact, it, it was this, uh, they were filming a scene, and then he came over to meet me, and and I was dressed well, you know like a lawyer dresses in khakis <laughs> and a shirt like this, and. And he was too for the scene, and he, he it was exactly the same color scheme. It was like khaki and blue, and he, he pointed at me and pointed at his. He says, "Nailed it, right? <laughs> he got, got it exactly right." And so he he started off, you know, with a great sense of humor, and I think you can see in in Woman in Gold and also in Deadpool and a lot of the the movies he does, he has a very good sense of humor, and so we sort of hit it off. Uh, and I, I, you know, I really enjoyed the, the the work that he did portraying me as a character. I think it, it, it's really uh, it's sort of fun for fun for me to watch. <laughs> and Woman in Gold turned out to be such a great film. I really loved that. Film. Thanks, thanks. No, I, I obviously I was 
scared because when you allow people to make a film, you don't know what they're going to do. They could have made it into anything they wanted. And I really didn't have any control. I had no creative control at all. But uh, I trusted the people involved, and I think it paid off. You, you know, you have to give them some artistic license. Everything's changed a little bit. Uh, there, you know, there, there are scenes that seem completely crazy, and most of those are actually mostly true and, and based on true things. Uh, sometimes they're exag exaggerated a bit, changed around a little bit. But what I really like about the film is that everything has, has a, a kernel of truth. Uh, and so when I watch it, I can see and appreciate the film as a film, and then I can also reminisce about the actual events that they're trying to portray. So yeah, I, I, can, really, I really enjoy it. You can look back and be like, oh, I remember that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so cool. it's, it, it turned out to be terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't guaranteed, but it, was, it <laughs> turned out to be a terrific mm -hmm. uh, experience for me. That's great. And now transitioning over to you are the president of the Los Angeles Holocaust Museum. Right, Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, which is the oldest Holocaust museum in the country. It was founded in 1961 by Holocaust survivors who had come here to Los Angeles. It was for many years part of the Jewish Federation. Uh, it was housed in the Jewish Federation building or down the street or next door. It was sort of a wandering museum and I had become involved about 20 years ago. and. Uh, ten years ago, they asked me to be the new president of the board. And it was before the Klimt case had finished, uh, right? but after the Supreme Court. And so I said, okay, who knows what's going to happen next for me. Uh, I'll do it. And I think <laughs> it was good karma because a few months later, then mm -hmm. I won the case. Uh, and at that time, they had, they had already started negotiating with the city to build a new museum building in Pan Pacific Park, which is next to the Grove and Farmer's Market. Mm -hmm like Fairfax and Beverly area. And, uh, and so when I won the case, and they already had some funding, I was able then uh, to, to also help with the funding of this new museum that they wanted to build. And uh, we had a terrific architect named Hoggy Bellsberg, who's also local here in Los Angeles. And we worked for five years to build this new museum. And it's been open now since 2010. The attendance increases it's increased 25% per year uh, for the last few years, and it's up to about 50,000 people per wow. year coming through. And I'm just very proud of it because I, I took a very active role, not in designing the, the building, that was Hoggy Bellsberg, but in designing the new exhibit inside. Mm -hmm. We took the old museum and we had to reconfigure it for the new space. And so I did a lot of that work and put a lot of effort into it, and, uh, and it really has paid off. I think people really, really are realizing that it's a great resource. It's, it's always free and open to the public. It's open seven days a week, and uh, it's, it's in that park there, so it's very friendly and easy to get to, and I just love going there and watching people going through. Uh, we get groups of, even during the summer, we've been getting tour groups almost every day, schools and camps. And you watch people going through, people your age, you know, and a lot of them, uh, most of them are not Jewish. They're not uh, really aware of European history or what happened during the Holocaust. And, and you can see it on their faces. There's like a little viewing perch on the second floor where I can watch people <laughs> go through. And, and you see the eyes sort of open like that and the mouth drop as people are introduced to this mm -hmm. unbelievable story of the Holocaust. And it's, it's not an exaggeration to say, that the Holocaust is the greatest human created tragedy in the history of the world. It sounds crazy to say it because it, it happened mm -hmm. just you know, a couple generations ago, but it yeah. is, there's nothing else like it. Um, and, and it's so enormous. And so when you see people who maybe have heard a little bit or not so much and, and coming through and being exposed to this uh, for the first time, it's tremendous. And on the other ha hand, we also have Holocaust survivors who bring their families through uh, and say, see that place, that's where I was, right? Uh -huh. And you know, this picture, that's a picture of me, or this is a, an artifact that I donated. Uh, and so we have, it's, it's somehow very um, homey in a way for mm -hmm. the Holocaust survivors and their families. At the same time, it's a, it's a real teacher's museum and very good for, uh, for students and, and teachers who want to bring their classes through. So I'm, I've been really very excited with the progress. I stepped down as board president at the end of last year, which was hard to do, but yeah. uh, I think very good for the institution. Mm -hmm. 
you know, sometimes you have organizations that are run by the same person forever and it stagnates. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's great that we have new leadership. Yeah. Beth Keen is the new president. Uh, our executive director, Samira Hutman, is fantastic. And she's co constantly coming up with new programming ideas. So uh, I'm very proud of it. It's, I, I, I think I'm, I'm as proud of, of that as I am of the Klimt case. Uh, it really, for me, it's a, it yeah. was a big accomplishment. And of course, with my own family history, uh, I had grandparents who escaped. I had a great grandfather and other family members who were murdered. Uh, it's very, uh, very meaningful f for me that I was able to take the success that I had and turn that into something that really could give back to the community in educating people about the Holocaust. I've been to the museum and it's amazing and really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And anyone who hasn't gone, really, they should go. Yeah, no, I hope I hope everybody gets a chance to go through whenever you're in that area in the Grove area. Yeah, it's it's just up. across the street. Yeah. And then now tying it all together with your family history, you're now very active in the genealogy. Yeah, that's true. Also, <laughs> I since since I was a little kid, uh, you know, they just remade Roots. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a series on TV, and when I was ten years old, uh, it was the first time that it was shown on TV here. And uh, I had a, a teacher who was who uh, was very influenced by it, and had us do a third grade project on a family tree. And so I went and I asked my grandmother about her family, and there was a book on my father's father, who was the composer Arnold Schoenberg, who was very famous, and so I could get a lot of information from that book. <laughs> and so I brought back this family tree that was enormous. I mean, in comparison to everybody else, it was just <laughs> huge, right? And, and so, you know, when you're eight years old and you find something you're better at than everybody else, that becomes your thing, right? So for some people it's basketball, right? For other people it's genealogy. So genealogy became my thing. I became the family historian and I've never stopped. Uh, the great thing about genealogy is it's this never-ending jigsaw puzzle. You're constantly finding and adding new pieces. And so um, about uh, s uh, six, seven years ago, I started uh, putting my family tree on a, uh, a website called genie.com, G-E-N-I.com. It was based here in Beverly Hills. Uh, for a while now, it's in Burbank. It's owned by, uh, currently owned by MyHeritage, which is a company in Israel. But it was started here in, in Beverly Hills by David Sachs, uh, who was one of the co-founders of PayPal. Oh, wow. And uh, it, the idea of Genie, which is different from a lot of the other companies, uh, is that it's one giant family tree of the world that we're building. Uh, it's not everybody has his or her own separate tree, but really it's just one, we're mm -hmm. one big giant family. Okay. And it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Everybody's putting pieces in. So when people put duplicates, your family tree or my family tree, if they overlap, we merge them together on mm -hmm. Genie. Um, about five years ago, I became a, a volunteer curator. There are about 200 curators. It operates sort of like Wikipedia, because mm -hmm. Genie, everybody can do everything and then their curators sort of moderate and make sure that things don't get out of hand and, and fix things where there are problems. And uh, uh, there's one curator, he calls us park rangers. We're <laughs> like, like park rangers uh, zooming around and making sure everybody behaves. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's been fascinating for me because I've learned not just about my own family history, which I obviously already know a lot about, but I learned other people's family history. And, and uh, I even did a project at uh, Sinai Kiba, where you went to school, and, and with our youngest son, Joey, when he was in fifth grade, he had a, a, a class project to do a family tree, uh, some type of project. And I said, OK, I'm going to do my project <laughs> alongside yours. Uh, and so I decided to build out the family trees of everybody in his class, uh, which included your family, because it was your, your younger brothers in his yeah. class. And so I helped all these families, there were 52 kids in the class, I helped them all build out their trees. And ultimately we connected all of them to this big world family tree. And I could show on Genie how everybody in the class was related to everybody else. So I could do a path from my son to your family or to any other family. And, uh, and that's what Genie is all about. It's, it's showing that we're all really not that separate. Mm -hmm. We're all very connected, uh, and it didn't matter that your family came from Iran and mine from Austria, there is a p connection between us. And, and uh, you can do that for just about anybody. So I'm a huge fan of, of Genie.com, and 
Uh, I don't own it, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I don't, I'm not paid by them either. I'm just a volunteer and, a, and an addicted user. But I think it's, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous project. And it's, uh, it's different from building your tree by yourself when you try to work with other people, other family members in, in uh, recording this history. And uh, I just, I, 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 my dream is that everybody takes part. Not, not necessarily everybody, not everybody's into it, but someone in each family needs to do it. Go on Genie, connect your family to the World Family Tree. Um, there are now 100, uh, it's closing in on 105 million connected profiles. Um, so that's a lot in one family tree, right? Some people say they have a big family tree, they have a few hundred, a few thousand, <laughs> right? 10,000, uh, you know, all those Persian bar mitzvahs, right? Where there are 600 people there, but 105 million is a lot. Yeah. And, uh, but we're all connected, uh, each and every one of us in the world. And it uh, doesn't matter where you come from, you're, you're connected to the human family. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, a neat thing for me to be helping to build this world family tree connecting everybody in the world. Yeah. And once you see how everyone is connected, it's really easy to become like friends and see we're all one. There's there's a, a comedian named A.J. Jacobs. He's a writer, and he uh, he set up something called the World Family Reunion last year, <laughs> or Global Family Reunion, and and his and he said exactly that. He says one of the reasons he he got into this is he realized like once you realize you're related to someone, you think of them differently. And his his example was he doesn't he doesn't like Judge Judy. This is like her voice is grating and I don't like it. And then he said, oh my gosh, she's my 16th cousin or, you know, my third cousin's wife's husband's un uh, third uncle, uh, cousin Judy, right? All of a sudden you look at her a, a different way. And that, and it's true. It's somehow true when you realize that this person that, that you're disliking is, is not really so different from you, you know? So we, you can do fun things like you can take Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and show how they're related because of course they're related. They're co six cousins or eighth cousins or tenth cousins. Everybody has a connection somewhere, yeah. and especially in American families, you can go you can go far back and usually find a connection. and uh, And so it's just it it humanizes people in a way and and breaks down barriers. So you don't think of people as the other quite as much, but yeah. just as part of the human family. Yeah. And so my last question is, what was the best advice you ever received and from who? <laughs> uh, the best advice I ever received, my parents taught me to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's, that's really a good, good lesson. Uh, I try to teach my kids that too. You can't, that's something you can't get back, right? Yeah. If, you're, if you're dishonest, uh, it, it, it's, it doesn't get erased. Mm -hmm. And so I've always tried in my life to, to be truthful and, and honest uh, at every occasion, even when, when there are consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that would be the best advice. At least, at least for me, it's worked very well. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much for you. joining Thank me. Thank you. That was really fun. Thank you for watching The Donna Show, and we'll see you next time.